uh, the Honourable John Kane, President of the Library Board of Victoria, uh, distinguished guests, and I uh, hope to show you that that includes all of you. You've, we've all got a unique brain. Uh, so, Redmond Barry, this picture I find rather imposing, uh, but you've heard of his critical role in establishing um, intellectual life in the colony, uh, which is strong to this day. Uh, and that he conceived the library, as Mr Kane has just said, as the People's University and, and supported the development of a number of other institutions as well. Given his recognition of the importance of scholarship and learning, I'm sure he'd be fascinated to hear how much we've learnt about the brain in the last 155 years, most of it in the last 10 years. And we now know that the richness of our environment has a marked effect on the development of our brains, on how we cope or recover from degeneration or damage to this vital organ. So the institutions that Barry initiata, initiated are part of the intellectual richness that surrounds us and has contributed to the development of our own brains. Until recently, we thought that the human brain's wiring and function um, were fixed after childhood. Now we know that the brain can adapt and repair itself thanks to the plasticity of its connections and the surprising ability to generate new nerve cells. So I'd like to show you how nerve cells communicate, what we mean by plasticity of the brain's connections, um, how memory is laid down, the fairly recent discovery of stem cells in the brain, and finally some work that's showing the living brain in action undergoing these plastic changes during training or re recovery. So this is a nerve cell in the brain. Um, each of us has something like 100 billion of these virtually nearly 20 times the number of people on Earth. Um, this is the cell body. There are a number of branches going into the cell body which are called dendrites. And studded on these dendrites, these little orange patches, are synapses where other nerve cells make specialised contacts uh, with this particular nerve cell. And the nerve cell then transmits an impulse down this projection called the axon, which co goes on to communicate with other nerve cells. Now, given that each of these 100 billion nerve cells is making something like 10,000 connections with other nerve cells, we have an immensely complicated network in our brain, much more complicated or sophisticated than any computer that's currently been built. We used to think these synaptic contacts were fixed after birth. Um, but now we know they're highly dynamic. And while I'm talking, you're making and breaking thousands, if not millions, of these synaptic connections. And here's some of the synapses in tissue culture showing how dynamic they are. It's the strength of these synaptic contacts which defines pathways in the brain which encode skills, memories and behaviour. Um, so the manner in which this happens is very important. Here's two nerve cells um, communicating with each other um, through specialised contacts called synapses. Um, and at this specialised contact blown up here, um, a synaptic end plate, um, is small packets of neurotransmitter, chemicals which are released when an electrical stimulus comes down this terminal uh, the transmitter is released into this cleft and then interacts with sp specialised molecules on the uh, receiving neurons postsynaptic membrane. Now, this process of chemical neurotransmission is an Australian discovery. It was Sir John Eccles' group at the um, John Curtin School at Australian National University who discovered in the 50s and 60s, his team, that neurons communicate both by electrical impulses and by this chemical transmitter process. Uh, I apologise putting up this technical slide, but in fact, most people nowadays have heard of these transmitters, such as acetylcholine um, in memory 
dopamine deficiency in Parkinson's disease, the role of serotonin um, deficiency in depression, uh, and so on. Um, the reason I put this up is to show that the chemical transmission process is very complicated. Um, and here's a video slide of an electrical impulse coming down uh, to the nerve terminal, into the cleft, diffuse across the cleft and interact with a specialised receptor molecule which lets these charged ions, sodium and calcium, enter the cell. Um, there is an uh, energy-dependent pump on the cell membrane which removes this excess iron and maintains the iron gradient on the nerve cell. Um, the electrical impulse um, then travels down the axon and interacts with another uh, synapse. So this is going on in your brain at extremely high frequency in a very complicated way. Uh, we used to think that there was one transmitter for one type of nerve cell, but now we know that most neurons have many different transmitters, usually one or more from each of those three classes that I showed you. And most of the drugs we have now for treating neurological or psychiatric disease interact with these classical transmitters. Well, what's neural plasticity? By plasticity, we mean that the brain is able to adapt and change in response to the environment, in response to uh, rehabilitation, in response to injury. Um, and part of this uh, plasticity um, comes about at the synapse level so that we can have increased or reduced numbers of synapses and individual synapses can be more or less active. This is a use-dependent phenomenon. So the pathways that you use get reinforced, the ones that you don't wither and become inactive. Plasticity is also used for another phenomenon in the brain of cellular plasticity, and that follows the discovery of uh, nerve cells, neural stem cells in the brain, which are capable of generating new nerve cells. Um, and this process of generating new nerve cells called neurogenesis. When I was a medical student, we were taught that the synaptic connections in the brain were fixed after childhood and that the brain was incapable of repairing itself. Now we know both of those things are, are wrong and, and that's the guts of my talk tonight is to show you some examples of plasticity of the brain, most of it derived in the last 10 years, um, and where I don't mention the institution from which uh, work comes, it's the Florey Neuroscience Institute here in Melbourne. The term neural Darwinism was coined by two Nobel Prize winning neuroscientists independently. Uh, Professor Jean-Pierre Changeau in Paris and Professor Gerald Edelman in New York. And what it refers to is the way that nerve cells compete with each other to make connections on other nerve cells or on peripheral targets. So this has major implications for brain development, learning, for memory, as well as for adaptation, recovery and repair after injury. Um, so this slide shows um, some nerve cells in the cortex of, a, of a, a human during development showing the increased uh, branching and complexity of the dendritic arbor um, during development. On the right-hand side, you can see the newborn human brain um, with fairly sparse neurons and sparse connections. During the first two years of life, there's abundant sprouting and con connections of neurons to each other. So the two-year-old has a brain with uh, uh, too many connections. And during development, learning and acquiring skills, language, these connections are pruned down by this process of neural Darwinism so that the pathways in the brain which subserve these functions are refined and facilitated. 
So the reason why a two-year-old may not be able to play the piano is not because he or she doesn't have the connections, but has too many, and, and many of them not appropriate for a skill. So this is a way in which the brain can be born and develop with great potential. Um, but depending on the environment that the child finds themselves, can develop specialised skills uh, and abilities which are appropriate to the environment they find themselves. So this young person's undergoing this process of neural Darwinism, um, nerve cells that are, are not connected to appropriate targets die back and connections that are not uh, uh, being used uh, cease to be functional. This is an incredible slide um, from um, work done in many parts of the world um, of tagging particular nerve cells uh, with genetic tags which show up as fluorescent uh, signals under the microscope. So for the first time we've been able to visualise this incredible complexity of nerve cells. This is a part of the brain called the hippocampus that we know is important for memory and learning. Um, and you can see the profusion of um, connections, uh, fibres coming out of these cells. Uh, and this is going to give us a, a tremendous window in understanding this connectivity. Uh, previously, it's been just too complicated to work out how this wiring was changed. Um, but this particular development is going to make a big difference to our understanding. So um, what are the limits to uh, human memory? Um, how much are any of us functioning at compared to our full potential? Strangely, I think the answer comes from people with brain impairments. Um, and this young man, Kim Peake, from the United States, shown here with his father, was born with multiple developmental brain defects. He had a defect in his skull, so part of his brain protruded through there. He had abnormalities that the fibre pathway which connects the two sides of the brain was missing. He had abnormalities in the cerebellum. His father was told by the neurologist that he would be severely mentally retarded that he wouldn't learn to walk or talk um, and he'd best be put in an institution and forgotten. Rather, the father devoted himself to this, to his son um, and his education. And during the subsequent years, extraordinary abilities emerged. Um, this man um, is an avid reader. Uh, he's read at least 7,500 books and can remember everything he's re read, um, apparently, in perpetuity. Um, he also can tell you the day of the week of any date, thousands of years back or forward. He knows all of the uh, area codes in the United States. Um, and so has an extraordinary brain. And with any luck, I'll be able to show you um, a, uh, a video When was Sir Walter Riley executed? October 29th, 1618. <laughs> yeah, what day of the week was that? It was a Thursday. Okay. Is it Oxford University? December 9th, 1995. Uh, it was a Saturday, and this year it's a Friday. Yeah. Oh your my next God, Thanksgiving? I love him! <laughs> I have so many things in me that you can't even guess them all. You know that? Kim Peek has one of the weirdest brains in the world. <laughs> He's become a living Google. What Kim represents is the dark side of the moon. He is in love with knowledge for the sake of it. One T. He's a confounding mixture of disability and brilliance that neuroscientists are determined to understand. It's a very exciting opportunity for us to find out what makes the human brain unique. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. He just amazes me. 
that. The life is nothing I ever expected. I think I'd do anything for him. So what's this telling us about our brains um, and our capabilities? Uh, here's a man with a brain that's severely damaged at birth, um, who has many uh, disabilities. He's unable to live without his father, who dresses him every day and looks after him. This is not a unique example, but it's perhaps one of the most striking. Um, these people are called savant syndrome um, and show extraordinary abilities mixed in with their disabilities. I think it's, show, it's uncovering a latent ability that we all have, that all of us potentially would be capable of these extraordinary memory feats, apart from the fact that we have developed mechanisms to, to block them, to forget things that are not relevant, to clean the slate so that you can function normally. Um, and it's interesting that along with um, limiting the storage of our own brain's memory material so that it, we only retain what's relevant to us in our everyday life. Um, we've developed ways of storing information outside of our brains, extensions of our brains, if you like, like this library that Sir Redmond Barry uh, started, um, like uh, uh, broadcasting, radio and television, and of course, most dramatically now in the digital information age, where there's huge amounts of data on the internet in places like Wikipedia um, that relieve us from the burden of carrying around huge amounts of information. So I think we're probably capable of memory feats like Kim Peak, um, but it's undesirable that we do so because we'd lose the ability to function normally otherwise. I'd like, now like to show you some work from Professor Gary Egan at the Flory Neuroscience Institutes, where he's looking at the areas of the brain involved in learning a motor task. And the subjects, normal individuals, were asked to learn one, three, two, four. One, three, two, four, that sort of finger movement. It, it, and as you practice it, you become more fluent. Um, and while the subjects were doing this, they were followed in an MRI scanner to look at the areas of brain activation uh, involved in this. The, so there were two questions. What areas of the brain are involved when you do a task like this? And secondly, how does it change while the individuals are training and becoming more proficient at the task? So they studied them after one week of practice, after three weeks of practice. We know that to do a task like this, that you act, you, you're being driven by the motor cortex on the opposite side of the brain. Um, but uh, no one had previously imaged a network of activity involved in such a task. So um, here's the, the motor task being done. Um, and this video shows you a schematic view of what's happening in the brain at the same time. And you'll see red and yellow areas, uh, which are areas of brain activation, accompanying different phases of this task. So for the first time, we can see not just the motor cortex, but a whole region of brain um, network, which is involved at different stages of, of learning the task. And then they went on and said, well, what happens uh, when you learn to do this task? And here um, are images at, after one week of practice in which the blue areas are actually decreases in activity uh, and the orange areas increases. So you can see a bit like I was telling you about neural Darwinism, even in an adult person learning a task, as they become more proficient, we can see many brain areas becoming less active and others more active. What about in a situation where there's been damage to the brain? Well, Professor Leanne Carey at FNI 
has been studying patients who've suffered a stroke, which has impeded the use of their right side of their body, and um, looked at two weeks and six months and compared them with healthy controls. So the, the healthy controls show the expected activation in the motor cortex here, um, but also activation um, on the same side and a little bit on the opposite side of an area called the supplementary motor area. The patients um, with the strokes showed less activity here in the motor cortex, which is not surprising, that's why she's studying them. But you can see an enormously increased activity in the supplementary area on the affected side as well as the opposite side and recruitment of a new part of cerebral cortex here in the pre-motor area. So here we can see uh, somebody who's recovering from a stroke doing so not because of increased activity or repair of the site of the damage, but by recruiting other brain areas that are involved in this motor control network. And at six months in those that um, made good recoveries, the uh, pattern of increased activity here shrinks back and looks very much like the normal. So here we can see neural plasticity in action. Well, it sounds as if neural plasticity is a, a pretty good thing, and in many ways it is. But um, I want to show you one example where it gets hijacked uh, and is a major problem, and that's addiction. 